Okay, how the internet works. We'll cover some of this. <clears throat> okay, so the internet's pretty awesome, right? Most of you uh, grew up in a time where the internet was just kind of there and you didn't have to worry about it. But if you talk to older people, they're always kind of amazed by all sorts of stuff that it can do. Well, you know, we didn't have that when uh, we were a kid. You ask your grandparents what they did for fun, right? They sat around the radio. And that, that was the thing. Uh, maybe you kids are, you're not kids, but you know what I mean. Uh, maybe you guys are uh, old enough that your grandparents are young enough that they watch TV, right? Maybe TV in the 50s and 60s was a thing. Maybe your grandparents are that age now, and that's what they did. So, yeah, but even then, right, people had TV, and that was pretty incredible to the radio people. Internet is pretty cre incredible to the TV people. Live streaming, right, broadband connections, that's pretty incredible relative to the dial-up connections we had in the 90s. So, a lot of neat stuff. Okay. So, evolution of the Internet, it's owned by a group of organizations. So, there's a bunch of cable and a lot of different organizations own part of that cable. So, there's not one single internet group that says, I'm going to tell you what to do. All of these people that own part of the system, they all agree mutually to do things in a certain way. And if you were here on Wednesday, you heard me go into more detail on this, but we're kind of blazing through. So basic thing, there's a high speed line, set of high speed lines called the backbone. The backbone crisscrosses the entire world. And that's like uh, if you think about water pipes, water pipes is the analogy I use for this because everybody understands water pipes. Anybody not understand water pipes? What's a water pipe? No? Right? Pipe full of water. Think of the cable as a pipe full of data. Now, up against your house, there's probably like a one-inch connection, right? A little piece of pipe about that big, da-da-da, which is enough for all your watery needs inside your house. It wouldn't make sense to have one of those great big transcontinental water lines that might be a 24 inch or 48 inch pipe, whatever. It wouldn't make sense to have one of those going right up against your house. Because nobody needs, number one, costs more, costs more to maintain, more dislocation to your yard, uh, you know, and you don't need that much water. Same idea with the backbone. The backbone, tremendously high capacity, fiber optic cable all bundled together, can handle a lot of this traffic but it's also really expensive and you don't need that much going straight to your house. So just like you might have a big water pipe, you know, to cover uh, the city of Chicago, right? To get it from the water towers or the pumping stations, wherever to your house. There's different regional networks, different local networks that basically take that, those, those big pipes and channel the big pipes into a set of smaller pipes. So you can have a smaller pipe going into your house. Okay. Now, other thing, in terms of how traffic gets to where it's getting, sometimes local networks can handle all the traffic locally. For example, if you're using Comcast and the next guy over from you and the next house over is also using Comcast, you don't have to access the backbone to get that message, right? You can send it up to, you know, some router and the router can say, oh, I'm actually also connected to this house. Boom, boom. We just go right back. On the other hand, if you want to send a message from you to your buddy over on the other side of the world, yeah, you got to go the back, use the backbone for that, okay? And there's a whole system for how that sort of stuff gets paid for. Okay. So, internet service providers, right? You guys know what internet service providers are? Those are the people that you pay to get to the internet with, right? So, there's all different levels of them. Okay, so here they show you local network, regional network, backbone. Those are different ones. Okay, so... Ordinary users don't connect directly to the internet backbone. Instead, they connect through a series of other networks called ISPs, Internet Service Providers. ISPs exist in three tiers. The first tier are the really big telecom companies that you've probably all heard of, right? AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, they own big chunks of the backbone, right? There are certain requirements set up for how much of the backbone they have to have, uh, how much they have to own. The other thing, they can connect to any other network using what are called peering agreements. So free data exchange. <clears throat> so let me, I'm going to open this with a little discussion. Let's see, I think, I know we have it. I'll, we'll, I'll defer to the actual slide. Okay. So peering is free data exchange. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, tier three, those are what are called the last mile providers. They're the ones that own the cable that actually connects to your house. Okay. So those are last mile providers. 
uh, they only use what are what's called paid transit. So anytime they want to ship uh, traffic to the other side of the world, they have to pay to use the backbone because they don't own it. Okay, so they have to pay somebody, hey, I want to use your backbone capacity. And the tier one provider says, yeah, okay, give us some money and let's talk. Okay, tier two are what's in the middle. So tier two ISPs, they connect to tier one and tier three networks. And they rely on a mix of peering and transit. So the definition of a tier two provider is number one, they use peering and they use transit. If they were all paid transit, they would be tier three. If they were all peering, they would be tier one, okay? All right, so tier two has a mix. Now, these classifications used to be pretty useful. 20 years ago, this is basically how the world worked. But there's a lot of blurriness these days. Uh, in particular, Comcast. Comcast used to be tier three, used to be just a last mile provider. Nowadays, it's classified as tier two because it does use a mix of peering and transit. But in the U.S., it's practically tier one. 99% of its traffic uh, is free. Now, there's a whole big thing around this about uh, why the other networks kind of hate Comcast. Fundamentally, it's this. Comcast, you pay Comcast directly, right? You pay them like, I don't know, a couple hundred bucks a month or something for cable. Maybe 300 now. I don't know. Uh, okay? And with all that money, where are they bringing traffic from? Where would you imagine most of the internet traffic is coming from these days? There's basically uh, three key applications that are probably like ballpark number, probably at least 70% of traffic. No, no, no. Three uh, advertisements are there, but they're not, not the, what, what do you think of the three big ones? What's that? No, no, not a network. What are the three big sources of traffic? The kind of things people do. Internet. Well, yeah, internet, but I always saying it's internet traffic. What do you think of the three big things on the internet? No. Hint. We just covered a module on one of them. YouTube. YouTube's one of the big three. What else? No, not Google's just sending out search results. It's, it's a lot, but it's nothing like these other ones. Facebook's big, but it's not what? No, not, not. What do you watch when you go home? Netflix. Netflix is used. And what if it's not on Netflix? Where do you look? Maybe. Amazon, right? Amazon, YouTube, Netflix, together, those are probably at least 70% of all internet traffic. Now, you're paying Comcast for that, but it's all downstream traffic, right? You go to YouTube, you put in like a two-word query about what you want to see, and you can watch like gigs of data, right? So there's very little upstream traffic. There's a whole lot of downstream traffic. You're paying Comcast directly. Comcast, they're getting all these other providers like AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, whatever, to carry that traffic for them downstream to your house. They don't have a lot of traffic going the other way though. Does that make sense? Okay, so yeah, people kind of hate Comcast. Not just the customers, the other networks too. Okay. So here's just, you know, an idea of how these are. So tier one's the big ones, tier two in between. The access ISPs are same as tier three ISPs. Okay, and here are the end users, whatever. Okay, so peering versus transit. Have you ever wondered why when you send an international letter, you put a U.S. stamp on it? Whoa, that's kind of weird. Has anybody ever thought of that? Well, you're thinking about it now. Kind of weird, huh? How can that be? Right, if I'm sending a letter to France, shouldn't I have to give the French postal system some money? No. I mean, you should. If you were sending a letter in France, you would have to. So the U.S. delivers the letter to France, and then those nice French people just say, oh, hooray, mail from the U.S., let's deliver it for free. Now, well, the assumption is traffic going one way is balanced out by traffic going the other way. So. For every letter that gets sent from the U.S. to France, they're going to assume there's another letter going back from France to the U.S., and it's all going to roughly wash out, okay? So it would actually be more trouble to track the individual uh, letters than it would be to just say, okay, yeah, it's probably going to balance out, okay? Now, when it becomes necessary, when there's a huge amount of traffic one way compared to the other way, then, yeah, you might come up with some kind of scheme to try to balance that out, and it does sometimes happen, but... In general, yeah, that, that's the reason why you only put, you know, your domestic postage on a letter going to another country. 
Same idea with networks, right? So for traffic's between the tier one networks, the big ones, the assumption is the aggregate backbone traffic going one way is gonna balance out with the traffic going the other way, right? They're just gonna agree to it. But again, if there's heavy traffic flow imbalances, like especially like Netflix is a big one, right? So you send up one request and you download like gigs of data to binge watch some series. Yeah, huge traffic flow imbalance, okay? Uh, interesting article here. It's from 2014, but it's basically still true. Uh, this is an article about how Comcast, you know, powerful and controversial part of the internet backbone. If you want to do some interesting reading there, yeah, you can check it out. Okay. All right, questions on any of this? Does this all make sense? So what are the key takeaways? Key takeaways are, what are the three different kinds of ISPs? What are transit agreements? What are peering agreements? Okay. <clears throat> so, routing. Routing is basically the process of getting information on the internet from one network to another. So internet, again, for people that weren't here Wednesday, internet means interconnected networks. So if you just have one network, you can come up with some kind of addressing scheme where you can deliver uh, packets to any machine in that network, and you don't have to worry about how, how the whole rest of the universe is set up. But once you start exchanging information across networks, you need to participate in some kind of common addressing scheme so that a device in one network can actually find a device in another network without being directly connected to it. Okay. So all that process of delivering uh, traffic from one network to another, that's what's called routing. Okay. So the basic process, typical internet use, you know, you use your device to request data from some kind of host system, right? You go to a website and ask for a page, or you, you know, start watching a video on YouTube, whatever, uh, you request some data. So the request and the data, they get formatted into packets. Packets are basically the envelopes that data gets sent in over the network. Uh, so, sequence clumps of data, typically less than 1.5 kilobytes. So, if you are watching a video that is 15 megs, right, which is pretty compact as that thing goes, then that would be about 1,000 packets. If you're watching 1.5 gigs of video data, that would be about a million packets, okay? All right. So, I guess 15 megs would be 10,000 packets, that's fine. Anyway, so for transmission across the internet, Packets are going to cross multiple networks before they get reassembled at their destination. So remember we talked about uh, TCP, right? What do we remember about TCP? What do we know about it? Yeah, it sends information. How is TCP different from UDP? Yeah, you was thinking of PCP, dog tranquilizers. Don't use dog tranquilizers. Yeah, they'll mess you up. Yeah. What do we know? It is connection-based, that's good. What does connection-based mean? Uh, see, now we're back to the whole Harry Potter thing. Yeah, okay. Connection-based means, essentially, you build a persistent connection between two devices, right? So basically, any packet you send over that uh, route is going to go through the same set of machines and the packets are going to be delivered sequentially. So you're gonna push the packets out in sequence, they're all going over the same path in sequence, they're going to arrive at the destination in sequence, okay? And if something happens with that path, if some part of it breaks, basically you have to rebuild the connection. You have to rebuild a new path. Okay, anyway, so packets travel across multiple networks before being reassembled at their destination. That was the thing with TCP, is you send them all in a sequence. With UDP, you fire and forget, right? So if you have like a million packets and you're sending them out with UDP, you're gonna send them one at a time and they might go over the same path, they probably won't, right? And they might arrive in sequence, but they probably won't. All right, anyway, so that's a little bit concrete what we were talking about a bit ago. Anyway, path of network devices between the client and the server is the routing path, right? The path of all these networks that all of that information has to go through. Okay. So, each router, right, so let's say that each of these end computers, right, is a source or a destination, but this one up in the left, he's a source, okay? So we wanna send a message from this guy to this guy. Now, if we're sending it 
in TCP, we're gonna build one best route, right? Going through, you guys can't see my. We're gonna build one best route, right, and use it. And so maybe message one goes over some path, message two goes over a different path, message three goes over a different path, but each complete message, like if we're sending a set of emails to that same destination, each email is gonna definitely go through one path. On the other hand, if we're sending uh, a set of six packets through UDP, right? Maybe our email is broken up into six packets. Each one of those packets might go over a different route. Like maybe one goes this way, two goes that way, three does, but four somehow zips around and goes that way, five goes that way, six we don't know yet, okay? Well, anyway, that's routing. So in general, because of the way the internet is set up, there's a lot of different paths between the source of the dest and the destination, okay? So each router, basically has to maintain a list of information about the network so it can make a good decision about where to send packets going forward. So each router keeps basically a routing table of uh, IP addresses, like essentially what the path is for each one. For example, once this source has constructed a path to this destination, it says, okay, I think I'm gonna send it this way, all it's gonna know, in most cases, it's gonna know if I want to send a packet to this destination, the first device I send it to is this one. This device is going to know if I'm going to send a packet to this destination, the next uh, device I hand it off to is this one. So that typically the routers don't maintain absolute detail about everything in the network because communicating that information would take a long time. What they generally remember is if they're going to send a packet to somewhere, they remember who the next device they have to hand it off to is, okay. All right, we'll talk a little bit about these network functions and then, uh, yeah, that'll be fun. Okay, so we know this, networks are built from a lot of different components and technologies, right? You got Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, circuit switching, packet switching networks. That's a little bit of techie stuff. It's okay if you don't know about that. Uh, wired, wireless, other mechanisms, uh, applications like email, web browsing, file transfer, FTP is file transfer protocol. BitTorrent, if you remember that, voice over internet. It's a lot of different stuff on there, right? How do we make it all work together? Well, here's our problem scenario. Here's our nightmare thing, okay? All of these things, web, email, BitTorrent, Ethernet, 802.11, that's Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth, right? If they all have a custom setup between them. So if you're using email over internet, that's different from doing ordinary web browsing over internet, Ethernet, which is different from using BitTorrent over Ethernet. This is the problem of custom interfaces, okay? That means if we want to add on a new technology like cellular networking, we would have to compose a new separate interface for every application. Likewise, if we come up with a new application, we need to devise a new interface for every different technology, right? We don't want to do that. That's too much work. Imagine every time you brought in a new application, you have to make it separately compatible with everything. Every time you brought on a new technology, you may have to make it separately compatible with every uh, application. Be a nightmare, okay? It's the word they actually use. This is a nightmare scenario. Huge amounts of work to add any new apps or media, right? Because you have to develop untold thousands of interfaces. And it's gonna limit growth and adoption, right? People aren't gonna wanna design new technology. Technology is gonna be slower to get adopted because initially it's not gonna be compatible with a lot of things. Uh, other problems, Sometimes the application endpoints may not be using the same media. So even different applications, you have to set up interfaces between, different technologies, you have to set up interfaces between. And bear in mind, there's a lot of different versions of it. Ethernet, Ethernet is, you know, wired communication. There's a lot of different uh, flavors of 802.11 wireless. So it's not just one and one, it's like, you know, 10 or 20 and about 50 for Wi-Fi. So you'd have to develop, you know, another thousand interfaces just for that. So the solution, basically APIs, the same kind of stuff that we talked about for YouTube, same kind of stuff you use on the internet. So you have some kind of what's called a magical abstraction layer. So essentially, any application agrees to format its uh, data in the standard packet format, okay? And any of these technologies agree to accept data in that standard packet format. It's as if we have a global postal system where everybody agrees on a common addressing system, right? <clears throat> so that's essentially what we're doing there. So 
That's what an API is. It connects all these things. So we agree if I'm doing, whether I'm getting a web page or sending an email or doing some BitTorrent, it's all going to get chopped into packets in the same format. And all of these technologies are going to handle packets in the same way. So there's no problem. Okay. So there's APIs on the technologies, APIs on the tech, on the applications. If I want to design a new application like voice over internet, all I got to do is say, if voice over internet releases packets in the standard format, any of these technologies can handle it. If I devise a new technology like cellular communication, right, like 4G, 5G, whatever, all I have to ensure, does it accept packets? If it accepts packets, then I don't have to do any uh, redesign on that. Okay. So it's very easy. Uh, O1 basically means for any new technology, I have to design one new interface. Doesn't matter how many other applications or technologies are out there. I design a single interface for the application that accepts the standard packets and that solves the problem. Okay? So it means very, very, very few limits on new technology. It's easy to develop stuff and they already all kind of speak a common language. Okay. This seems like a good break point. So, I'm going to stop the recording.